you know, summarizing my previous talk. <laughs> okay, there's more to it. More. Okay, recall that um, we wanted to uh, mathematicize the problem of understanding the behavior of these simple mechanical systems. So we, we made a definition. Uh, we say that uh, points, we have some uh, diffeomorphism, say mapping a space to itself. We say that uh, points P and Q are forward asymptotic if they uh, converge in forward time. So this gives us an equivalent relation on X, uh, which is sometimes uh, a lamination, hence keeping with the um, theme of the conference, but often it's uh, something wilder. Uh, I, the term turbulation, I think, is due to Misha Lubitsch, um, right, suggests that it's, uh, <coughs> it's a whole lot messier than, than a lamination. Okay. Okay, so um, that gives us some kind of decomposition of the, uh, the phase space or the dynamical space. Um, whoa. Sometimes it's interesting to, uh, well, there's kind of <coughs> uh, corresponding decomposition of the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the space of all dynamical systems, which might be the, the space of, of diffeomorphisms, or it might be our, our parameter space. Right? So we say that two, uh, <coughs> two maps are topologically conjugate if there's a homeomorphism that conjugates one to the other. Okay, so if there is a homeomorphism that takes one to the other, then it takes the partition for one, the dynamical partition for one, to the dynamical partition for the other. Okay, so the relationship of topological conjugacy gives us some decomposition of the, of the parameter space, or the space of diffeomorphisms. <clears throat> um, yeah, so... Um, Oh, there, there are a number of, of um, yeah, so there, there's, a problem, there's a technical problem here which can be solved in two ways. One is by assuming uniform continuity or restricting some interesting compact subset. Sometimes one solution is appropriate, sometimes another. Let me just leave it vague. Um, leave it vague. I would be more specific, I would be more specific and concrete if I was actually going to solve one of these problems. But, um, <laughs> posing interesting problems, and uh, later on I'm going to give excuses for not solving them, so I can leave it a little bit vague. Okay, so uh, yeah, here's, here's the problem. Uh, the problem is this is a tremendously complicated question. Uh, I mean, it can be tremendously complicated studying any given, any given diffeomorphism if we want to somehow get a picture of the space of diffeomorphisms. It's it's um, tremendously complicated. So I suggested last time that one thing we might want to do is restrict to some kind of uh, model system where our space of diffeomorphisms now becomes, uh, is replaced by space of parameters. Okay, so the model system that I mentioned last time was the, uh, the, the, <coughs> the Hanon diffeomorphisms. Um, see, for people who look closely at transparencies, so I've got, this should be like a F sub A C here instead of B. Okay. Um, and, right, we discussed last time a little bit about the pros and cons of going to this, this complex system, with, but that's what we'll be discussing today, the complex, the complex system. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the fan is on. That would seem to suggest that I'm close. Good. Right, so this is a very familiar picture. It's the Mandelbrot set. Um, um, right, and <coughs> this, um, okay, so this, this inc incorporate, encoded in this picture is a kind of, uh, at least conjecturally, is a uh, dynamical partition of, of a parameter space. Um, Let's see, someplace. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so this is the, the Mandelbrot set. Okay, so the set of, uh, inside this picture, the, uh, the set of hyperbolic parameters. I mean, that's one of the things we're interested in. I mean, so first of all, the set of hyperbolic parameter values is an open set. It can be divided into, uh, you can look at the various components of that open set. The complement of the Mandelbrot set is one of the components, and conjecturally, the other hyperbolic components fill up the interior of the, of the Mandelbrot set. So from this picture, we can see that even something like understanding hyperbolic components and how they fit together is, a, is an interesting and challenging uh, job, even though the theory of individual hyperbolic uh, uh, maps or diffeomorphisms is, is well worked out. Okay. Um, Right, so, yeah, so um, what we would like to do here is somehow uh, bring the study of, of uh, complex diffeomorphisms up to, the, up to the level here, up to the, up to the point in, uh, let's see, if we think of two parallel streams here, one is the, the, the one-dimensional theory and the two-dimensional theory, we'd like to develop the two-dimensional theory up to the point at which uh, Duwadi and Hubbard uh, introduced these, these pictures and uh, really started to, to analyze them in, in detail. Okay, we're not at that point, but we'd like to move to that point. Okay, so let me say a few things about uh, how you describe these various uh, components here. I'll say it in generality here, but um, the, there are very specific and useful ways of, of describing it. If you have a component in the interior of the Mandelbrot set that corresponds to a, a connected Julia set, in that case it's useful to consider um, external rays. So external rays are just um, external rays are just uh, gradient curves of the uh, green function of the Julia set. Right, we saw a green function G plus last time. Well there's a corresponding G for the Julia set. Okay, in order to um, so we have this function G, we can consider its external we can consider <coughs> these gradient curves. Now, technical point here, um, we don't really need a metric to talk about a gradient curve. It suffices to, to have a complex structure here, right? If we know what the level curve of a function is and we rotate the level curve by i, we, then we know what the gradient curve is. So we get these, these curves. If you actually follow these boundaries in this picture, you get these various external rays landing on the landing on the Julia set. Now in this um, hyperbolic situation, this landing map from the space of external rays gives us the landing map <coughs> which takes a, a ray to its endpoint as a continuous map. A, the landing map is it's continuous and it's surjective, uh, finite to one. So it gives us a model of the Julia set, a topological model of the Julia set in terms of certain identification relations, okay? which is a useful, useful way to build a model. Now, um, the more, <coughs> the combinatorics of this identification relations, uh, one nice way to understand these is, is, for example, in terms of Hubbard trees, which give a very uh, convenient system of organizing this information. Okay, so um, that's a review of the one-dimensional picture. We'd like to know what relevance this discussion has for the complex Hainan map. Um, so recall from uh, Eric's lecture of yesterday that if we define this set uh, J plus minus, or J minus plus, to be the, it's a subset of J minus, right? So the, the general picture, whoop, the general 
schematic diagram here is we have some <coughs> some set uh, <coughs> k, k plus whose boundary is j plus and we have some consisting of points with forward bounded orbits we have this set j minus <coughs> now j minus is in two pieces. There's the part of J minus inside K and there's the part outside K. So this part is this set J minus plus. Okay, so Eric explained last time that uh, when the Julia set is connected, let's make the normalizing assumption that the Jacobian determinant is less than or equal to one. And for our map, that's just the coefficient A. So um, this is not a serious, a serious restriction. We can always, could always look at the inverse if we wanted to um, deal with other maps, but let's make that assumption. So uh, Eric pointed out last time that if uh, the Julia set J is connected, then this set J minus plus has a Riemann surface lamination. Okay, so that um, the fact that the Julia set is connected does not by any means uh, is not a dynamical, doesn't say that our, our, our object here is dynamically nice, we still may have <coughs> this set J minus may still be a turbulation, it may be not a lamination, but there is at least some subset of J minus which is very nice, which is laminated, okay? But it may well be that the leaves of this subset uh, run into each other or do strange things as you get to the boundary of K. Okay, but um, this subset is nicely laminated by Riemann surface laminations and if you restrict the function G plus to a leaf of this lamination then that function has no critical points. Well if that function has no critical points we have a, a downhill direction, right? So we can talk about a, a gradient uh, line for that, for that function. So we're look, considering the function restricted Riemann surface Right, again, we can, uh, we, since we have the complex structure, we can take the level surface and rotate by I, so we can make sense of gradient lines okay, on this lamination. So we can make sense of gradient lines out here in J minus plus. So that means that in this context, when the Julia set is connected, we can talk about external rays for our complex diffeomorphisms. Okay, well we can talk about external rays. Um, we can't do very much with external rays in this level of generality. Even in, for, for Julia sets, before the external rays are trying to give you some uh, symbolic description of your Julia set J, they only succeed when they actually land. And they don't, external rays don't always land. So we need some additional hypothesis here to make these external rays into a useful tool for analyzing the symbolic dynamics in two variables. Well, they're undoubtedly, um, yeah, there are undoubtedly weaker hypotheses that make this work, but we're just gonna go, we're, <coughs> we, don't, we don't have those theorems, so we're gonna assume that um, we're in the hyperbolic situation. Okay, so this, we're gonna assume that our map F is hyperbolic with a connected with a connected Julia set. So it's well known in, yeah, right. So um, if our map is hyperbolic, then we have the following, the following picture. Um, the space of external rays, in one variable the space of external rays is the circle, in two variables the space of external rays is the solenoid, so an inverse limit of the circle under the doubling map. Okay, so it's, we have a kind of a standard model for the space of external rays. All external rays land. Okay, so we can follow them down to points on the Julia set. The landing map is continuous, surjective, and bounded to one. So again, we can use we can think of our Julia set as a rather tame quotient of the solenoid under a certain equivalence relation. 
Okay, and then the last point is that um, the, if you look inside uh, an unstable manifold, recall with this hypothesis, with the hypothesis that F is hyperbolic, we really do have a lamination. All of J minus is laminated by stable manifolds. Each of these stable manifolds has a natural affine structure. So if we look inside this stable manifold, um, the set K plus, this, the intersection of K plus with this unstable manifold satisfies a John condition. I'll explain a little bit more about that in in my and when I'm in the picture here. Why, so why are there hyperbolic maps in this map? Why should I believe there's even one of these? Why should you believe there's a hyperbolic map of in this particular family? Um, well, there, either there are or there aren't. <coughs> okay. Um, either case is kind of interesting. Um, no, I, let, yeah. Why should you believe that? Good question. I don't think that I don't think the no, theorem the requires the theorem, the theorem doesn't the theorem doesn't I, I'm gonna I'll give John Hubbard's answer in just a minute but first I'll give my answer here I saw John's hand and he has I know his answer but uh, my answer first is yeah the theorem doesn't require that there are any hyperbolic maps right it, say this I mean in fact if you could use this theorem somehow to show that there were no hyperbolic maps in this in this family you would have an amazing result. It would be, I mean, it would really dash a lot of hopes. It would really change the, change the direction of dynamical systems, for example. Okay, so it would be cool if there were no hyperbolic maps. So let's assume, let's assume, let's assume there are some. And uh, yeah, so either way. Now, let me give you uh, John Hubbard's answer, which is that um, um, Hubbard, 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 well, uh, yeah, Hubbard and Oberstworth have actually constructed some uh, hyperbolic maps in this setting. Now, the, their technique of construction is to start with a C parameter value corresponding to a, um, a hyperbolic map in the Julia set and perturb the Jacobian parameter a little bit. Okay? So then you get a hyperbolic Hainaul and diffeomorphism. So that's is that your answer? Exactly. Okay, that's, that's an answer. That's an answer. Um, yeah, but I, I, you know, and those are interesting maps to look at, but those, if, if there were just those maps to look, I mean, if those were the only examples, then this would still be a rather, uh, um, I mean, a, a theorem with few examples. I think, in fact, from, that there are lots of examples, and this, is a, this theorem actually is not going to be useful in ruling out examples. That's going to be useful in analyzing the examples. But, okay. Let's. Yeah. Well, let's look at an example that's not obtained by. Yeah. Let's look at an example which is not obtained as a perturbation here. So the, uh, this is a, a, a real Hainon map here. What I've, what I've, what's drawn in the picture here are the stable and unstable manifolds of a uh, fixed point, which is up here in the corner. Here's the fixed point. Um, these stable manifolds presumably correspond to uh, the, the unstable manifold, closure of the unstable manifold presumably corresponds to J minus, and the closure of the stable manifold presumably corresponds to J plus. We also in this picture have sinks. There's a fixed sink someplace in here, and there's a sink of period three that um, moves around here. So there are various sink basins in here as well. So. Um, it's not proved that this map is hyperbolic, but it probably is hyperbolic. There's some circumstantial evidence, a great deal of circumstantial evidence that it's hyperbolic, but it certainly is not a perturbation of a one-dimensional example because every one-dimensional, a one-dimensional example can have at most one sink orbit. 
Every sink orbit attracts the critical point. There's only one critical point. So it's certainly not a perturbation having two, two sink orbits of different periods. Yeah. And also from the point of view of the natural phenomena, that the physicists like Shvitanovich compute these at the physical level of rigor hyperbolic examples all over the place. Yes, that's right. That's right. Very elaborate yeah. So there's a great there's a great deal of circumstantial evidence. There are lots of hyperbolic examples. Okay, but in terms of so is the real you're telling me the real phenomenon real slice is the real slice, but does that imply that the entire hyper four dimensional? Is that what you're telling me? No. So let's. Uh, that's only a real. I mean. This is only a real slice of the picture. It's useful to get some kind of complex picture of what's going on here, right? Now, we can't uh, draw C2 easily yet, but what we can do is we can take uh, this unstable manifold through this point, okay? Now, in C2, this unstable manifold is a, a one complex dimensional manifold. So that's something that works very well with computer screens, as, as the current technology of, com of computer screens. Okay, so we can take this unstable manifold, right? And inside that unstable manifold, we can draw, we can consider the forward orbit of points, whether the forward orbit is bounded or unbounded, right? Every point in the, this unstable manifold has a bounded backward orbit, but we can draw the, the forward orbit. And if we do that, we get this picture, here, maybe it's upside down. Right, so in this picture, this point over here corresponds to that point on the right. Okay? And you can actually, if you look at this for a long for a while, you can see a correlation between these intersections with the sink and these intersections with the components here. These are kind of fattened up versions of the Well, it starts off horizontal and bends around here. And this is, so we really, to look at, see this in space, you'd want to fold it a little bit. But um, if you just think of the linear ordering here, how you intersect these various basins, that corresponds to this linear ordering here. The little round ones here are the period three basin. The funny shaped ones are the fixed, fixed basin. Okay, now, <clears throat> Here's a, here's a conjecture. So, oh, let's see. Now, I mentioned that um, one thing that happens in this hyperbolic uh, connected setting is that our, our set satisfies, the, satisfies a John condition. Okay, so a John condition is... Um, uh, so, a <coughs> John condition means that, <coughs> means that we can build a... Well, so if we, for, for each point here, we have some external ray that lands at that point. It means we can build a carrot around that, that ray, which is contained in the complement of the... Um, so if this is our... If we have some external ray coming down to this point in black, we can build a carrot around this ray, which is in the complement of the black region. Okay, there's certain certain uh, channel around our path here of a definite, definite width. Okay, so conjecture, uh, here's a conjecture. The conjecture is that um, uh, if this John condition holds, some like, something like this John condition holds, then you're either you're in the hyperbolic situation or you're that far away from the hyperbolic situation. You're, es you're essentially, you're, you're in some very manageable, nice situation. Okay, so we can take the fact that this appears to, to satisfy a John condition, and it does appear to satisfy a John condition, we can take that as evidence that this map is probably actually hyperbolic in all of C2. Okay, so this is actually an, inter be an interesting pro project to show that this map was hyperbolic, but it hasn't been done yet. So the analogous thing is true in one dimension? Uh, right, the, the John... The, the uh, hyperbolicity on the real line implies yeah, it is true in one, in the one case, it's not true in two dimensions. Yeah, it's not true that hyperbolicity in the real setting implies hyperbolicity in the complex setting. 
Um, okay, so we have these external rays that we can consider here, and we can, um, that allows us to make some sort of combinatorial model of the Julia set. In fact, if we can, just knowing how external rays are identified in one of these unstable manifold pictures, if we assume that our map is hyperbolic, not, it's not proved, but if we assume that it's true, it determines the equivalence relation on all, all external rays that, um, that uh, make, this, make this map. Okay, so um, uh, Ricardo Oliva has <coughs> used this idea to develop, to build some models of uh, of Julia sets by modeling this equivalence relation of external rays and this is a uh, picture he he produced where he's drawn external drawn external rays and here you see some of the examples of rays that have been identified um, so there is we do have some sort of scheme for keeping track of these identifications it's not as elegant as Hubbard's theory of Hubbard trees but um, it does uh, allow us to start making some conclusions about uh, what's going on in parameter space. It allows us to use the computer as an intelligent tool here to investigate some of, the, some of the behavior in parameter space. Okay, one of the nice things about one complex variable is there's a nice interaction between the, the empirical investigation using computers and actual proofs. One thing nice about being in the complex situation is sometimes you can prove what you can see. In the real case, rarely, right? You can see a lot of stuff that you can't prove. Okay. So, um, let me explain. So, here's an example taken from Ricardo's uh, thesis uh, showing how uh, the topology can change as the parameters change. Okay, so here we have one pair of identifications we change the parameter, we get another, a, a different pair of identifications. Now, Ricardo has this, uh, this automated in such a way that he can, um, um, has been able to analyze a great, a, a large amount of parameter space. So let's see, if we, <clears throat> so our parameter space depends on two variables, A and C. So if A is, if we think of just making A real but allowing C to be complex becomes a three-dimensional parameter space instead of a four-dimensional parameter space. So uh, when A is equal to zero, our map is degenerate, and in fact the uh, dynamics uh, are just the same as the one variable complex polynomial. So down at the case when A is equal to zero, the um, the, the parameter plane looks just like the, the Mandelbrot set, right? Um, as A increases, there's some, some variation here. Here what Ricardo has done is drawn how sink basins move through one another. Here's the fixed sink basin. Here's a period three sink basin. As A is increased, uh, it moves, this period three basin moves through the period two basin, and over here it moves into the period one basin. In fact, that's the parameter value of the map that we, that we drew before, where you have a sink of period one and a sink of period three. Okay, well, um, what Ricardo has done is just looked at the restriction of this plane to when, when C is, is real. And um, here are some of his, let's see. So, here are some of his curves. Here's a little, here's the period two. Peri the green in green, the part in green is the period two basin, the part in blue is the period three basin. And these are curves where dynamics is, is changing, where certain pairs of rays are changing their identifications. Some of these things correspond to changes in dynamics in the real case, and some do not correspond to change in dynamics in the real case. So we can see that there are indeed are bifurcations which are completely, completely complex and not, and not real. Okay, so this is a, um, 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 just an example of um, using some of the theory and some 
some of the theory to uh, try to understand some of the, the for example, the, the, um, some of the behavior in the complex parameter space, in particular the complex, the connectivity locus in the uh, two variable parameter space. Let me refer you to two, uh, so the thesis of, of uh, Ricardo Oliva is one source for more information, and there's also a manuscript uh, in preparation by uh, Booth and Hubbard, where they also are using some of these computer tools to analyze the behavior of the um, connectivity locus in C2. Um, right. Okay, so uh, many of the things that Ricardo has discovered here in his, with his computers are um, not surprising, they're, um, but there are, there are some things he discovered that are surprising. One of those is that um, unlike the, the A equals zero slice, the, there are some other slices which are, which are disconnected. So that is a, the A equals zero slice. It's a classic theorem of Duaudi and Hubbard that the slice is connected, but appears that there are other slices which are disconnected. So uh, in some ways, the uh, two-variable theory is following the pattern of the one-variable theory, um, but in some ways it's diverging. But that <coughs> stands to reason because it really is a more complicated... Um, uh, is that a real intrinsic statement of the slice? It just uh, you know, it doesn't have any intrinsic meaning, but the, so the, the degenerate slice does have intrinsic Yeah. Um, it's constant Jacobian. Um, they seem to be natural th things to look at, whether they're, um, yeah. All this, all, this, all this is kind of preliminary, uh, just involved. And in, I mean, we don't have a compelling overall picture yet like we do in the one variable. One variable case, which kind of ties together the combinatorics and uh, geometry uh, a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's see. Right, so <clears throat> part of the hope in uh, de part of the hope in developing the this trying to develop a theory of complex Hanon maps is that there will be some um, positive feedback to the real case, which is an, the case that kind of motivated things to start with. Um, now, if you, um, in the one variable case, what, it really took a long time before there was positive feedback from dynamics of one complex variable to dynamics of one real variable, but when it started to happen, it happened in a very powerful, powerful way. So, um, so far there is not much uh, that we can say about the real case from the complex case, but there are a couple of, couple of intriguing things that we can say. Okay, so when our parameters uh, A and C are real, then our complex Hanon map gives us a, restricts to a Hanon map, Hanon diffeomorphism of R2. Okay, so we have really two dynamics to think of. We can think of the F, the, the complex dynamics, let me write that F sub C, and we can think of the real dynamics, and let me write that as F sub R. Okay, and we wanted to, um, find ways of uh, interrelating, these, interrelating these two. One interesting, one interesting connection, so, uh, is, well, so in, the, in this real state case, our <coughs> pictures are invariant under complex conjugation. So the real dynamics here is the dynamics <coughs> in an unstable manifold, for example, is the dynamics intersected with the real axis. Now, the points we're looking at are the points that are in J and in the real axis. In other words, in the boundary of K and in the real axis. And if you look at these points in this picture, you see these points have two external rays meeting at, at such points, right? They've got two symmetric external rays meeting there. So if we have some model of the space of identifications of rays, 
Well, we also have some model of the, uh, of the real dynamics, right? And um, <clears throat> if we have, well, so being able to identify these rays with points on the solenoid gives us some kind of, uh, some kind of generalized um, uh, external angle, some kind of symbolic sequence. So for these points, we can use this external angle to construct a symbolic dynamics for the real Hanon map here. And in fact, we can, um, at least when the Julia set is connected and the map is hyperbolic, we can determine some kind of needing invariance for these real Hanon maps from this complex picture. Right? So we have, it's not, um, so that's very much like the one variable case in which you can determine needing invariance uh, for one variable maps from external rays in the complex picture. Now, in the one variable case, there are many, there's an alternative way of determining, determining invariance. You have a unimodal map. You consider an orbit which side of the bump it lands on. But in the two variable case, there is no neat alternative method of describing uh, a symbol sequence in terms of how you're landing with respect to uh, a critical point because the map is a diffeomorphism, there are no critical points. So this is some combinatorial structure along the one-dimensional loop? Yeah. Plane. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a stack of these combinatorial That's right. That's right. 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 Mm -hmm. So, so the, the equivalence relation is really telling us not just about behavior in one leaf, but about all external rays. So. It's fitting together these various leafwise, leafwise pictures. So that's, I think that's one intriguing direction to consider um, where um, we don't, um, uh, it's, it's, it's intriguing because uh, it gives you something concrete for the real Hainon map where you didn't have anything concrete, didn't have much concrete before but it's still, uh, there's still problems with this. Uh, at the moment, at least, it seems to require that this um, uh, complex Julia set be connected. And that's a little hard to interpret that in the real, completely in the real case. So the fact, the building this symbolic dynamics depends on something that you don't, have, don't already see in the real case. So there's lots, of, lots more to do there to make that better understood. Um, well, let's see. If we go back to the, um, yeah, if we go back to a s simple one variable picture, all right, we have a, um, <clears throat> so in the one variable picture, we have the, the space of external rays is the circle, right? For each of these points on the circle, we have some kind of uh, address in terms of zeros and ones, which we can think of as the dyadic expansion of the angle. Okay, the, some of the rays hit, the, hit real points, some of the rays don't. Um, now, in the case of the solenoid, we can think of a, the solenoid as the inverse limit of the circle, so we can think of a point in the solenoid as corresponding to a bi-infinite sequence of zeros and ones. And um, so, we get a, a kind of, uh, well, bi-infinite sequence of zeros and ones, so we're getting some kinds of equivalence relations between those sequences of zeros and ones, but the, <clears throat> what's happening is that the upper ray and the lower ray being symmetric. Oh, so one, complex conjugation. Pick out. Complex conjugation, so we get a sequence of zeros and ones where the two rays correspond to precisely the opposite sequence of zeros and ones. So in a situation like that, if you look at the difference of successive terms, that's independent of the ray, and that corresponds to the needing sequence. Okay. In, in, the, in the one variable case, in the two variable case, we can define that as the needing sequence, or the itinerary with respect to the critical point. Okay, so, um, Right, so that's one direction, uh, one connection here between the real and the complex case that 
needs some further investigation, or I think warrants some further investigation. Um, let me give you another connection here. So much of our theory has been a description of the, uh, of the, the set J, right, which is some subset of C2. Now, in the real case, you know that this subset is itself invariant under some kind of complex conjugation, but when you slice it, you, when you slice J with R2, you're getting some subset of J, subset of J, and um, much of what we say becomes vacuous when you're considering a subset of J. On the other hand, if J were actually contained inside R2, then we, would, then we have some powerful tools to analyze the real case, right? Okay, in that particular situation, if J is contained in R2, our theory really works for the, really tells us something concrete about the real map. So that's an interesting question. When, um, when does that occur? When is J contained in R2? And we, uh, Bedford, in this paper with Bedford and Lubitsch, we have following equivalent conditions <coughs> that describe this situation. Okay, so the first one says, first one talks about the topological entropy of the real map. You know, the topological, by a result of Friedland and Milner, the topological entropy of the real map varies between zero and log two. So log two is the maximum value. We can look at those cases where the maximum value is, is assumed. Okay. The second property here is that J star, recall that J star is the support of this measure mu. It's also the closure of the set of um, periodic points. Second condition is this set J star is contained in R2. Okay, the third condition is that J, which was the intersection of J minus and J plus, is contained in R2. The fourth condition is that K, which is all bounded orbits, is contained in R2. And the fifth condition here says that F to the N has two to the N fixed points, that is the real map has two to the N fixed points for every N, which says that all of the fixed points of the complex map are actually contained inside the, the real locus. Okay, so if any one of those conditions holds, then all of those conditions holds. And in fact, they imply that J star is equal to J, which is equal to K. Um, okay, let me make a few um, remarks here about the, the implications, the various implications here. If the um, topological entropy is log two, well, let me sh explain why one implies two. Um, well, it uses the fact, recall that this measure mu that we constructed is kind of the analog of the Bowen measure in hyperbolic theory. Well, one of the interesting properties of the Bowen measure is that it's the unique measure of maximal entropy. It's the only measure whose entropy is log two. So if we know that um, the entropy of our real map is log two, it's a result of Newhouse that there's some measure supported in R2 um, where the entropy with respect to that measure is log two. But mu, in thinking inside of C2, mu is the unique measure of maximal entropy. So that measure inside R2 must be this measure mu. So mu is inside R2. The support of mu is inside R2. So J star is inside R2. Now J star, um, this is for the analysts. Um, there may not be many left here after I insulted them in the first talk, but for the analysts, I, I can explain why two implies four. J star is the Shelov boundary of the set of, uh, of K. If the Shelov boundary is real, then the set is real. So if J star is real, then K is real. But K contains J and J star, so four implies three and two. Um, and then two is equivalent to one. Uh, and then condition five imply if uh, F has, if all the fixed points are, are real for every N, then certainly J star, which is the closure of the set of fixed points, has to be real. So five implies two, but clearly four implies five. Fixed point is a, is a point with a bounded orbit. Okay, and all of these imply that these sets are all equivalent. 
2 to the n is the upper bound for the number of fixed points of f to the n by Bazou's theorem. Okay, so. You could state condition 5 prime is counted with multiplicity, condition 5 is counted without multiplicity. So they're equivalent, counted with multiplicity or counted without multiplicity. In fact, if either one of these conditions holds, then every periodic point is hyperbolic, is a hyperbolic saddle, so has multiplicity 1. Are these hyperbolic maps? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, what are some examples here of, of such maps? Um, yeah, let me get the right transparency here to <coughs> bring the rest of this. Okay, so here's an here's a example of one of these maps, which is the horseshoe. Right? Now, the horseshoe has um, <coughs> entropy log 2. Um, using symbolic dynamics picture of the horseshoe, you can see that the uh, number of points of period, the number of points fixed by f to the n corresponds to sequences of zeros and ones of length n. There are just two to the n of those. So this is, this is clearly one of the examples of this type of behavior. Now the horseshoe is also a hyperbolic example. Okay. Um, but you might ask whether there are uh, examples which are not hyperbolic. And the answer is yes, there are examples which are not hyperbolic. And we can get that by um, using a technique of Dennis's called pure thought. We can, we can see that there are, that there are uh, non-hyperbolic examples of maximal entropy maps as well. Right? So if we just take our parameter and vary the parameter all right, so what happens? Eventually we're going to get some place where the map is not a horseshoe anymore. Okay, but uh, in the meantime here, the set of parameter values for which the map has maximal entropy is a closed set because entropy is actually a continuous function in the real Hainan map. The set of values where the map is hyperbolic is an open set. So there's that last, at least one value there, which is of maximal entropy, but not hyperbolic. Okay, so. To violate five equivalent to five prime, I'm sure it's What? Doesn't that violate five equivalent to five prime, I'm sure it's No. Oh, by pure thought. Oh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> if all the country is hyperbolicity. Hmm. No, but it, it's interesting applying pure thought to five, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, five tells us something about the kind of, kind of de degeneracy that can occur. Okay, so... Um, so in terms of the picture, you're just pushing things down so that the stable will not be stable and that's Yeah. Presumably, right. So let me, let me make, uh, I should say a little history about this. When, um, so there's this, there's this gap here, right, which is, which is, seems to be the relevant factor here. When this gap is quite large, it's a result of uh, Devaney and Nitetsky that this is a horseshoe. Um, Hubbard and Obersworth improved that um, to when the gap is moderately large. It's still a horseshoe. Um, I mean, it's still, it's still actually hyperbolic. So, um, Eric and I have the following result. Okay, so this is a theorem which has been announced for a long time and hasn't actually appeared. So this, this statement up here is, is a, a, uh, a promise here to the audience that this will be out soon. Um, okay, it won't... Not, not a question of years here, it's a question of months. Okay, so the, the theorem is that if F satisfies one of the equivalent uh, conditions in the previous theorem, i.e. maximal entropy, then there's only two things that can happen. One is that uh, F is 
itself hyperbolic. Okay? The other, f is not hyperbolic, but it's not hyperbolic in a very specific way. It must have a quadratic tangency of the stable and unstable manifolds of its one-sided fixed point. Now, a horseshoe has two fixed points. Okay? It has one down in the corner and one up in here someplace. One-sided means that if you look at the unstable manifold to this point, the stable manifold only intersects it on one side. Okay? So it has a unique one-sided fixed point. Okay, so the assertion is that the only way that this can lose hyperbolicity is by creating a uh, homoclinic tangency at this point, and in fact, additional information is that the tangency is one-sided. Okay, now, the, the, the pure thought exercise tells us also that we still, that none of the periodic points have lost, have disappeared here at this point, but in fact, even more is true, each of the, there's a uniform expansion on each of those periodic points. And the uniform expansion, each of those periodic points is expanding by at least a factor of two. Okay, so we haven't even started to lose any um, hyperbolicity on those periodic points. Of course, as soon as this crosses here, or as soon as we decrease the topological en entropy, then we've definitely lost periodic points. So there's some critical parameter so that up to that parameter, the, map, the topological type is constant and the map is hyperbolic. At that parameter, the map is very close to being hyperbolic. When we go past that parameter, all hell breaks loose. Okay? Every, we go through, infinitely, uh, go through uncountably many topological, uh, topological types when we pass that parameter. What is the one-sided fixed point? Yeah, so uh, one-sided means if you, if you, um, I'll draw a picture. Pardon? Well, you're, you're thinking about the horseshoe here, right? In fact, our theorem, we don't know that, our, that these maps are horseshoes that we're applying our theorem to. So we have to, this is based on what we can prove rather than what you observe here. Um, but, <laughs> If you have, if you have a, a fixed point with an unstable manifold and a stable manifold, you can look at, looking at that unstable manifold, you can look at its intersections with stable manifolds. Okay. To be one-sided means they all occur on one side of that point. Okay. Um, are, are things transverse and also just a fixed point? Right? Yeah. Uh, right, there's a unique orbit on which things fail to be transverse, which is, which is this one, right? Unique orbit on which they... I believe we can, believe we can prove that. So maybe I should say a little bit, of, little bit about why, how complex techniques allow you to, to do something like this. Um, right, I said earlier, in response to a, uh, uh, a challenge about hyperbolicity, that we feel confident that this John condition allows you to, uh, uh, this John condition means that you're really in a very nice dynamical situation. We feel confident about that. We can't actually prove it, but we nevertheless feel confident. But there's one case in which we can use the John condition to get a lot of good consequences, and that's this case. So why does this hypothesis apply that we imply that we have the John condition? Well, let's look at an unstable manifold. Okay, an unsta in it, if we look, consider an unstable manifold and draw one of these pictures here where we draw the set K in black, well, we're, if we're in this maximal entropy case, K is contained inside R2 so that K is some subset of the real axis. If K is a subset of the real axis, we have the John condition in spades. We have a very strong John condition. In fact, we have a John condition where our carrots have angle pi. Right? So morally speaking, this strong John condition 
lets us, um, is, the, is the starting point for analyzing this case. More, more technically, we use this, uh, the fact that our set K is real, we use this kind of John, John condition to uh, get information about the growth rate of the function G plus restricted to the leaves. And if we, in fact, we note, we, we determine that, that growth rate has to be uniform, that allows us to do a number of things. One is that the uniform growth rate gives us a uniform expansion. That's how we know that we have uniform expansion in all those <laughs> critical points. Um, well, it gives us, certainly it gives us uniform expansion at periodic points. Uh, another thing that this growth rate does it, is it allows, a, is it says that the family of, of uh, unstable manifolds is a normal family. We have some bounds, some uniform bounds on the speed at, with, at which this unstable manifold can, dro can grow. Well, that lets us pass to the closure of the set of unstable manifolds. One of the, another one of these good analysis tricks. Um, and we, we discover that this closure of the set of unstable manifolds of periodic points gives us a candidate unstable manifold at every point. Okay, now there's two possibilities here. One is that these manifolds are actually regular at every point. If these manifolds are regular at every point, we, know we, we, we have uniform growth and we conclude that the map is really hyper, hyperbolic. Another possibility is that one of these limits of regular manifolds is itself degenerate. Well, the only way that can happen is by um, mapping by z goes to z is, is a two-fold cover of a non-degenerate manifold. Z goes to z squared. Uh, and that, the place where that occurs is <coughs> exactly here. If you take a limit of, think of a limit of, of folding maps here. So in the picture, this tangency gives us a limit of folding maps coming down here. So we get here, and when we pass to our normal, normal family, we get a two to one parameterization, or we get a, an n to one parameterization of this unstable manifold. But if you, if you have, the, if you know Say, if you know, if you have an n to one map from one unstable manifold to another unstable manifold, and you know that the pullback of some subset of the real axis is actually real, well, there's only one way that can happen. That subset of the real axis must, the map must be two to one, and that subset of the real axis must lie on only one side of the of zero, right? It must be a hat, must be a ray. Okay, so that's how we get this conclusion about the one-sidedness of the of the fixed point. Yeah, so I mean, that, I mean that when the periodic point comes back to where it starts after n iterates, that the expansion constant is, is at least 2 to the n. Of course, that's not true for non-periodic points, right? There is, but it's, it's true for periodic points. But the periodic points are convergent to the canceling. Curious, isn't it? Try some pure thought. What, what must that mean? <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if you'd like to say some words about Ricardo's exotic solenoid. Um, oh, Ricardo's exotic solenoid. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. That's, that's, um, <laughs> is, is this just fair to an extended talk like this beyond? <laughs> um, well, I'll say, I'll say a small number of words about Ricardo's exotic solenoid. Okay, so if you, uh, if you look at Hubbard and Obersworth's examples, the set J minus is a nice lamination, and the lamination that you get is the inverse limit lamination you get from the corresponding one-dimensional map. 
Okay. Well, if the if the if the Julia set is connected, then the complement of the Julia set is a nice solenoid. And in fact, if you if you have some basins of attraction, if you look at the the lamination on that basin, that's also a nice solenoid. It's a, like a if you, if the map comes back, I mean, comes back after n iterates, and you get a a nice solenoid. Now, it uh, it might be tempting to conjecture that basins, all, that the intersection of J minus with a basin might always have that structure of being some kind of uh, or a cone on a solenoid. It's tempting to to suggest that. In fact. Um, Playing around with this this particular example, and looking at this, uh, the identifications that occur inside an unstable manifold, uh, I think R Ricardo and uh, John Hubbard and myself collectively discovered that uh, this basin of attraction, rather than being a cone on a solenoid, a, that is, a, yeah, cone on a solenoid, is a cone on some kind of generalized solenoid, some kind of expanding, uh, one-dimensional expanding map over a branched one-dimensional manifold. And one of the features that's interesting here, instead of getting an entropy of log two, as you would for the solenoid, we get an entropy of golden mean. So it's really different, right? And so in fact, the, the expanding map looks something like, something like this where the small loop maps over the large loop, and the large loop maps over the large loop plus the small loop. So that's it. examples of fun things you can do with um, combinatorics of complex Hanon maps. So it's not exotic, it's the same delta. It's just another version. It's another hyperbolic solenoid. Right? Um, I don't know. It's not a, yeah. I mean, the family is always parameterized by Markov partitions. You mean these one dimensional? Yeah, one dimensional solenoids generated by matrices of zero to one. Some of them might be. Right, right. No, it, it's not. I mean, there, there, certainly there's. there's it's, it, yeah. I mean, it depends on your, your viewpoint here. If you're thinking, if you're, if you're from the dynamical school, this is, this is a cousin. Of, I mean, there's a nice family here of expanding maps, expanding maps on one-dimensional spaces. Uh, if you see one, why not see others? Um, on the other hand, it, it can be surprising. I mean, it, it really dem it demonstrates the, the, the even though this, this uh, identifications here are somehow happening with zeros and ones, uh, there really are some Genuinely different phenomena in the two, vari in two variables than what you see in the one variable case. So, so well, this, this phenomenon is just tangents that are kind of generalizations of the Chibershaw one dimension. Exactly, exactly. And the Chibershaw one dimension of that uh, motion, motion map of hyperbolic maps. Yeah. So, do you expect such a feature in the two dimensional situation that there is a hyperbolic map or is this? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what to expect. I would say that um, there is, I mean, I would expect that whenever you have this John condition, you get some kind of Miserevich-type phenomenon. Um, but uh, it's a little bit like this. If you phrase your, your question too narrowly, you're going to be wrong. I mean, I'd, I... I I'm not, sure about, I'm not sure about the connection with, I mean, I think you get something that's morally uh, very close to being hyperbolic with some small changes, whether it's honestly close to hyperbolic with some small changes, I have no... John, no. Yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Instead of, there, instead of it, it's broader than, than the Miserevich type, but it's... Um, uh, much of the analysis for that Miserevich type should apply. And, yeah. Well, this, we could talk more about this, but, yeah. Thank you.